something else. This from, as you know, occasionally I've talked about an experiment that people have done, different one. One of them uh, was knowingly using super oscillations, the Zaludev, etc., based on uh, based on Toraldo de Francia. And then the one Stefan held is Stead microscopy, which did involve a, a, a dark light and uh, and therefore super oscillation, although they, they didn't realize it. Well, here's another one where people didn't realize, and I was truly amazed to see this in nature a few. Uh, a few uh, y years ago. Um, it said that when people get Nobel Prizes, they, they don't um, always do good work afterwards. But here's a guy who, 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 who did. And this is Ahmed Zewail, who he got the prize for um, femtosecond uh, uh, laser chemistry a number of years ago. And then, amazingly, I found this paper by him, um, which uh, uh, it was a few years afterwards. So this is called photon-induced near-field electron microscopy. And it's pure, pure weak measurement. It's really, I, I, I called Sandu and I said, look, I've just seen this paper. You know, I've described it to him and he said, yes, absolutely weak measurement. Good. So the idea is this. You want to look at something, a carbon nanotube, let's say. And that's what they want to look at. And you send an intense pulse of light to illuminate it. Okay. Now uh, that light bathes the nanotube and near the nanotube there are evanescent waves. Now these evanescent waves, of course the point about evanescent waves is they can contain fine detail, um, you could call it super oscillations, we sometimes don't, but no, it is fine detail, finer than the wavelength, along the nanotube but decaying away. And you want the information to be transmitted far away. Okay, so there's this detail. So what he does, they, um, this sub-wave sub information, and it, it, what they do is they also send electron beam, electron beam at the same time. They send this electron beam to arrive simultaneously with the light beam, and the electrons, I'll show in a minute, will carry away this fine scale information. How will they do it? Because those electrons which bathe the uh, carbon nanotube, of course they see these photons and they'll get these kicks, what I call super kicks. Um, and uh, those electrons, like the others, will be s transmitted far away. And uh, if you select only those electrons which have gained a substantial number of photons, the ones which respond to the super oscillations, you select only those that make an image, then uh, you can see fine detail. So the electron, it's a really a fine, it's a really beautiful thing. I mean, it's a, it really is a, a weak measurement. You're selecting the electrons that carry the fine detail. So uh, here's the electron energy gain or loss, gain or losing photon, the function of energy. There are electrons that gain one photon, two, three, four, five. And you can select only the ones that gain a large number of photons. And when you do that, this is what you see. So this is an electron microscope image. This is the thing you're seeing, but you want to see it with light, of course. And here's 500 nanometers. Now, uh, and here are the energy filtered images up to about four photons. Now, what these different curves are, are curves that you get if you time the electrons to arrive at slightly different times. It's hard to get it right. And uh, so you see that uh, this one, when you get, it arrives exactly on time, it's, uh, you see that um, with light of, uh, I think light is 600 nanometers, I can't remember. And, uh, and uh, uh, so here you see you can resolve the fine detail of the carbon nanotube. So it's amazing that it works. I mean, these people are virtuosos of what they do. But I just wanted to tell you about it because it's pure. I, I, didn't, I meant to write to them, but I didn't. It's, it's pure, um, it's pure uh, weak measurement, carrying away the information in super oscillations. Oh, the wave, oh no, the wave is a thousand nanometers, excuse me, wave is a thousand nanometers, so they really are seeing small things. Sorry. What does it mean up to four photons? Uh, more than, actually. I should have, it means more than. Oh. More than, yeah. So you're seeing, it's the, it's the ones that carry the fine information, yeah. <coughs> I said it wrong. So, you know, excuse me, it was a, it's a thousand. These are, um, these are in the infrared photons. So, a clever example using hybrid 
fields to see small things. Okay, but now I want to talk about optical super oscillations and what I think you can and can't do uh, in this talk. And there's also some interesting, I think, mathematics that needs further study. So, it, it, here's an op you have an optical image, there's a wavelength lambda. And you want to combine super oscillation with super resolution, I'll distinguish them in a minute, without using evanescent waves. Because everyone knows that uh, if you're near field microscopy, if you're near to an object, you can see the fine detail. It's only that it doesn't propagate. That's what we have to understand. Right. Now, here's a, here are three lengths. There's the um, scale of the thing you're looking at, you want to see. There's the wavelength. And there's the largest transverse Fourier component. You see, you're thinking of a beam. It has a longitudinal and it has a transverse Fourier component. The wavelength is to do with the length of the wave vector, 2 pi over it. But you, 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 we're interested also in the, in the sideways uh, variation because that will determine whether it's super oscillatory or not. So there are some interlocking inequalities. Super oscillation means that the thing feature you want to understand is smaller than the length corresponding to the uh, largest transverse wave number in the lateral field. Okay, that's the band limitation, right. Super resolution means the thing you're looking at is smaller than the wavelength. And no evanescent waves means that uh, your wavelength is smaller than the reciprocal of this band limited transverse K. It means that the beam it has some finite angular width. It doesn't go beyond, beyond uh, 180 degrees. So these are these interlocking inequalities. Now you've got to be very careful because uh, there's a sensitivity to noise in, uh, in this uh, business. Um, so for example, so you, you have a function which uh, is super oscillatory and you add epsilon's worth of random phase and see what happens. Um, well, uh, I'm choosing the, the canonical super oscillatory function with n equals 10 and this a that gives the degree of super oscillation equals 4. If you've got no noise, of course you see the super oscillations. You've seen pictures like this many times. Um, what are these different curves? Well, that's the function itself, a logarithm of the modulus, the real part of it. And this is the uh, logarithm of, it's the function you would expect would have the fastest oscillations on the basis of the Fourier content. So now you add uh, 10 to the minus 5 of, of uh, random phase and still you can see the super oscillations. But if you add 10 to the minus 4, they've gone. They're very sensitive, 10 to the minus 3, of course they've gone. So super oscillations, as you would guess, are sensitive to noise and you know why, because they're very delicate, coherent destructive interference phenomena, which of course always very sensitive to noise. Okay. Now, Sandu and I wrote a paper a few years ago, um, this one, and uh, which actually has got more attention than I think it should have got in retrospect, although of course we were always very pleased, uh, and I'll explain why. You see, we, he came to me with a question. How long do super oscillations last if they represent an initial condition for a Schrodinger equation? Say, in one dimension, x and time. Okay, so you have this at one dimension and time evolves. And do the super oscillations last very long? The answer is, they do decay. I mean, it's a long calculation. And you involve the method of stationary phase, very carefully considering the integral representation and looking at the asymptotics of it. And then what we found was that uh, they do still decay exponentially like evanescent waves do, but there's a factor, n actually, where n is the n of the number of components in the super oscillation, enhancement. So they still decay exponentially fast, but, but there's this exponential that means they're slightly longer. Now, of course, it's true, and this work done here uh, shows that in a different way. If n is infinity, it means that you overcome that exponential and the stuff will last forever. But, of course, then what lasts forever has zero strength. So that you can't win, you know, or zero strength relative to the value outside. 
But anyway, we, we, we published this, and we made the point that, uh, of course, the Schrodinger equation is the same as the paraxial wave equation. Instead of time, you've got distance. And so we, 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 we were actually very careful to say that um, we, we, we were, what we'd done, what we had done, also described the propagation of paraxial waves. But what we didn't do was to point out that actually paraxiality, if, once you leave paraxiality behind, you destroy the super oscillations and the problem comes back with a vengeance and can be solved, which I'll get to. Okay, so why is it that it doesn't work? The paraxial approximation is inadequate. Paraxiality means that the span of uh, angles in your beam, plane waves, uh, is rather narrow compared to minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And, uh, however, even if you have paraxiality, the first thing to go are the super oscillations. I'll explain why. So here you've got uh, some function that you're looking at. Uh, it's, the, it's the source, if you like. And the wave is a function of x and z, and you've got these, these waves. And the initial wave, there it is, is some um, sum of uh, uh, plane waves, like we've been discussing, with this sideways k. So the sideways k is actually this k, times sine theta, where the theta corresponds to each of the plane waves. Well, it propagates exactly, according to the Helmholtz equation, to uh, kz, kx, then there's minus z square root of uh, little k squared minus big k squared. So that's exact. And uh, it, this is band limited, and there are no evanescent waves, because I'm assuming that this k max is less than the little k. So this is always a real phase. It's not, a, it's not an evanescent uh, contribution. Okay, now the paraxial approximation, which approximates spheres by parabolas, is uh, simply to take uh, the, um, uh, the, the first term in the Taylor expansion of this square root. By the well, here I'm including three of them, but uh, paraxiality is the first one. Now, it's enormously widely used. It's one of the best techniques, best to, The reason is that you can do a lot of integrals analytically if you've got k squared as opposed to square root of k squared minus k squared. Okay, so fine. Then, uh, and praxial approximation ignores that correction term. And uh, you'd think it's good if k max is very much less than k. It's it, uh, because of the, the, the quotient there. Um, okay, so this is now paraxiality k squared times propagation, and uh, non-paraxial is a smooth version of paraxial. It's a convolution. You can easily show it. So the non-paraxial, where I just include that first correction. You can do it exactly with all of them, but let me just take the quartic correction. Non-paraxial, as a function of, I'm calling it psi, is, uh, oh, excuse me, I should, this is x, forgive me, x, function of x, sorry is the smooth paraxial with some smoothing function. And what is it? It's this. It involves this, uh, involves the quartic term, and it's a calculation. You have to uh, use the wave equation and, 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 and calculate it. Now, what is this smoothing function? Well, there it is. It's a blurring, and uh, one wants to know how substantial that blurring is. Excuse me. Um, okay. Uh, well, it turns out from the scaling law that's in here that the paraxial wave is smoothed by a distance delta x, which is this. It's a wavelength to the three quarters times z to the one quarter. It's something, of course, has dimensions of length. Okay, so the farther you go, the more that the, the paraxial, non-paraxiality smooths fine detail. No surprise there. So, said it again. The paraxial wave is smoothed by something. Now, a good case to consider is something called the Talbot effect. That's this. Suppose your object is periodic in X. Then, uh, in the paraxial approximation, it's also periodic in Z. So, paraxially, and this is why it's a very good test, your initial object will be exactly reproduced. And what is that distance? It's d squared over lambda, where d is the period. So, we've got the object that's periodic, and we're looking at this fine detail in it. But, uh, which we want to understand, and we know that paraxia, this will reproduce itself at some distance. Okay, 
Now, at that distance, the non-paraxial smoothing, you put z here, d squared over lambda, is the square root of d lambda, and the point is, that's always much greater than the wavelength, uh, because the d is always going to be greater than the wavelength for this to be an intelligent procedure to apply at all. And so that obscures all the sub-wavelength oscillations. So, paraxiality is exquisitely sensitive to I mean, excuse me, super oscillations are exquisitely sensitive to non-paraxiality. So this won't work, that's the point. And, and we had, actually there were in our paper numerics actually showing this, but you, if, you, if you think of it ab initio, you can make much more convincing pictures, and you really do see that uh, you, you start out with this subwave, these oscillations, paraxially, you rep go to this Talbot distance, everything perfectly reproduces, you put on exact non-paraxiality, you don't have to do this approximation, and then you see, still you see all the structure of the object except the sub-wavelength structure that, that you want to see. The same kind of uh, ratios you see here, you have here, appear in Fraunhofer and <coughs> Fresnel diffraction. Is that coincidental? Um, I don't know what you're referring to. I mean, well, I know, I know near what field and far field diffraction. No, no, this, this is all... Um, it wouldn't be related. No, because this is, all of this is near field. It's all near field. This is all near but field. it's the same kind of ratio. It's all, no, it's all near field. Far, okay. and in fact, the whole point of the Talbot effect is it's precisely a near field phenomenon. You see, I mean, in practice, of course, no s periodic object is I infinitely extended. Okay, a near field is where you don't see the effect of the edges. Uh, Fraunhofer is where you go so far away that uh, you're seeing the effect of the edges and it's one object. So, so it's not really that. It isn't that. Okay. Nevertheless, and this is the new thing, it is possible to propagate subwave information exactly, non-paraxially, over an arbitrary long distance h and multiples, but at a price. And the rest of the time I want to spend talking about that. So this is the paper. Exact non non-practical transmission of subwave thing detail. So this is very exciting when I did it until I found the price, which you'll get to. Um, so we, now we have the Helmholtz equation. No paraxiality at all. And uh, there's a class of exact solutions. It's called the Montgomery representation. It's obvious how to do it. It's periodic in the propagation distance period h. Well, here they are. Look, some coefficients, of course, and then here's the z-dependence, it's integer over h times 2 pi, so of course this reproduces exactly, but of course the sideways propagation has to compensate to be able to solve the equation, so there it is. Now of course, if you want to have no evanescent waves, as we do want to have, then the n is limited by this k factor, and that means that the, the, the largest um, I'm, I'm saying 1 to n, and you can then go plus and minus, just, it's just convenient. The largest n is basically h over lambda. So, the farther you want to reproduce, the more coefficients you can include in the description of your object. So, you can represent objects with 2n Fourier coefficients, and uh, 2n is roughly 2h, two two, uh, uh, and, uh, excuse me, where, sorry, n is h divided by lambda. So, in principle, you can sample an object with more Fourier coefficients the farther away you want this information to propagate, which sounds like a very good thing. You know, that's what microscopy is. It's, you have something here, but you want to propagate the information and look at it far away. Um, now, there are various variant schemes. I mean, you can ask, suppose you want objects periodic in X as well. Now, if X period is L, if you want that, then uh, you've got a number theory problem. Because the, the X wave number must also be an integer of L, and that's a problem now, finding M's and N's that solve this. You can do it. I almost wrote a paper about it. I did a lot of work on it, but in the end I didn't bother. Uh, but there is, you could do it, but uh, you greatly reduce the number of Fourier coefficients available to you. So forget that. Um, oh, yeah, I said, oh, yeah, I have it here. E, suppose the L equals the H, just as a mathematical thing. Then uh, the number of solutions of this is proportional to the square root of log N. Okay, so that's, uh, you're not doing very well compared to what you had before. And then there's a diffractionless version where you don't have to wait at um, 
at particular um, discrete distances. You can look at any distance, and this was uh, uh, done by Macris and Psaltis. But for that you need two-dimensional objects, which often you have, uh, and the intensity is independent of Z. And the scheme works like this. I I'm not going to discuss it anymore, because I want to go back to the one I mentioned. But, but uh, So you have an object, and you choose your... K0 is your external wave number. And you choose the wave number K, common to all plane waves, and therefore the factor involving Z comes out, so it doesn't affect the intensity. And then you've got the X and Y, the Y you make periodic in, uh, in H, but the Z uh, will, will, will not be. But that doesn't matter, you've got something that's independent of, uh, of Z, and they actually used it in a rudimentary uh, way. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to go back to the scheme I mentioned. So periodic in H, not periodic sideways, but representing the object by a number of uh, Fourier coefficients, which is equal to the distance you want to propagate the information divided by the wavelength. Now you de-dimensionalize everything. It's very convenient to do that, as always. De uh, so you scale the distance z in terms of up to 2 pi, the, the repetition distance. You scale the, x, the x's in terms of some scaling d that we will represent the detail we want to look at. And then uh, there comes the parameter that we have, and, and then uh, Oh yes, and then uh, h over lambda, which is the thing, roughly the number n, I'm calling it q. Right, these are dimensionless variables. And uh, so this a is a dimensionless measure of this d, and uh, the q is a dimensionless measure of h. It's just the number of, essentially the number of uh, Fourier coefficients. And you want it to be large, because you want to finely sample the object to see its detail. Now, uh, so here I'm just writing now the scaled wave. Instead of x and z, you've got psi and zeta, and you've got this periodic in, uh, in, in, in z, and you've got this other structure, and you've got this nice one here. So q goes up to n. Right, good. Now, you, you choose an initial object you, you want to reproduce. So here it is, um, and uh, uh, when um, zeta equals zero. And... Uh, it saves a lot of writing and nothing in principle is lost if I take an object that's even in X. I don't have to do that, but it just, it will save me a lot of writing. So let the object be an even function with detail in it. Um, and I sample it at N points. I sample the object at N points. So I choose these points here. Uh, there they are, psi M, and here's my object. And then I can find the coefficients, because this is a matrix inversion problem. Uh, so, let me show you how it works. This is, my test object is two Gaussians, and I want to resolve them. Okay. And so here it is, it's a Gaussian uh, uh, at half S and a Gaussian at minus half S, with some width. And I want these to be uh, uh, ra rather small, these widths and separations. Now, I can represent this as a matrix problem. You see, I've got these, co I've got the function I want, these two Gaussians, I, I'm going to be repeatedly showing you, uh, and let the values at the sampled points be Fm, and uh, this is then a matrix equation which I could invert to find these coefficients. We'll discuss the inversion in some detail. There it is, a little matrix equation. And then I'll have my sampled object on any scale I want. Determine the coefficients by matrix inversion, as I said. Now, I don't have to do this, but, you know, we're physicists, and we do like Hermitian matrices, and, and uh, so, uh, as I've written it, the matrix need not be real symmetric, but I can choose the sampling points to make it real symmetric. I choose more samples near the ends, and uh, if I do that, I've got this nice, um, interesting matrix, which I don't think is any of the matrices that you read about in books on special matrices, but still it has a structure which we'll be discussing. Let me show you how it works. So here we are, I've chosen uh, two Gaussians separated by a quarter wavelength, and their widths is a twentieth of a wavelength. That is a real challenge for microscopy, of course. It would be lovely if uh, people could see that. And, uh, okay, so this, uh, and I, I've chosen uh, 
a situation where I have 31 samples. Now the target is this thin curve and the smooth curve generated by the samples I've chosen, more of them near the ends, are these dots and that's the reconstructed function. Okay. Um, well, um, whoops. Now the price you pay is that outside the reconstructed region the function is absolutely vast and I want to show you that now. So here we are. We've got the object in the reconstructed region which is minus one to one in this notation. You go a little bit outside from minus one and you start to see it going down. Well, it gets worse and worse. If you go from minus 40 to minus 40, you get to 10 to the 39. And finally, you, you, it, it stops growing when you get to about minus 150, but 10 to the minus 60 or so, 10 to the 60, 10 to the minus 60. And of course, the structure that we wanted to see is really lost in the middle here. The common behavior of super oscillations. Still, in principle, you have exactly reproduced this object at different distances uh, h. So there we are, and there we are, and there we are, and there we are. Good. So that you need 50-digit arithmetic to do these calculations, because um, they're not very stable. How did you choose sampling points then? Pardon? How did you choose sampling points? Choose the sampling points by... Um, uh, by, by you determine how far you want to be able to look at the, to see the structure and then you choose the sampling points to make the matrix real symmetric. I don't have to do that but it will make things simpler later. So I sample more points near the end of the object that I'm interested in. But there's a definite optimization. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now as I've said that's, that's the price you pay outside this uh, sampled uh, region. It's absolutely vast. I need this 50 digit arithmetic. Now, um, to examine this more, I mean, here's this n by n matrix, and it has its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors, and uh, let me show you something about them. And you can use the eigen representation, these eigenvectors u, lambda, to, uh, to calculate the samples. I calculated them by direct sampling, but you can do it uh, uh, using the eigenvectors. And, uh, so here it is, you, you have some coefficients times a superposition of the eigenvectors and uh, that superposition, the d's, are the overlap between the eigenvectors and the function you want to sample, the usual familiar thing. Okay, if I would write it in quantum notation it would probably look a bit better. So uh, then the Fourier construction coefficients are these coefficients times the eigenvectors divided by these um, eigenvalues. Now let's look at them. Here are the eigenvalues for a case I wanted to look at. A is a quarter, Q is 15. I want to go 15 wavelengths and reproduce things. And these are logarithms. Never mind the smooth curve. Let's look at these dots. And you see there are some extremely small eigenvalues. That's bad news for matrix calculations. It means that the matrix is very ill-conditioned. Uh, means that finding inverses of the matrix is why you needed this big, uh, high um, accuracy arithmetic. There are very many small eigenvalues, and that's it. That's something that you can't do anything about, I believe. Um, let's look at the eigenvectors. Well, here they are. They look as though they're sort of, os the lowest one is because just one, but then they oscillate, and again, there are some curves, which I will discuss in a little while. Um, okay. Now, for small j, that's larger eigenvalues here, these vectors approximate smooth curves. Of course, they're discrete. It's a discrete matrix. But the eigenvectors approximate smooth curves. And that suggests a continuum approximation. Now, several of you have asked me about whether there's a continuum approximation to super oscillations. And this sort of obliquely discusses that question. And you'll see how subtle it is. But anyway, it does suggest that for large Q. You know, you've got many, many samples, so you can, uh, it, it, it's as though you ha have a continuum. The, the, the contributions, the waves are very, very close together. Um, so here's this n by n matrix. Now Q is large, and so m on Q, as you go from one m to the next, is almost continuous. So let's define some continuous variables. X is this quantity, X squared. Y is this quantity. Lambda are the eigen values divided by Q, it turns out that's the scaling, and uh, 
we define this continuous uh, uj of x for the jth eigen, um, eigenvalue as uh, being a slightly scaled version of the original. And the point of doing that is that the eigen equation is then an integral equation. Of course, because you're making a continuization. It's a rather curious integral equation. Here's the matrix. Here are the eigen vectors in this continuum approximation. And here are the, um, here are the eigenvalues with this, with this scaling. OK. Now, so there's the, it's a new matrix. And here it is. Here's the kernel. Now again, this is an integral equation that I haven't seen before. It doesn't mean it, people haven't studied it. It's just I couldn't find it. It may well be at some standard somewhere, but I haven't found it. Now, here it is again. This is, I've just written it again, and A is this, um, is this uh, coefficient measuring to do with the scale at which you want to sample the object. Now, there's a natural basis of even, even functions on 0 to 1. I mean, minus 1 to 1, but you've taken them as 0, which are the Legendre polynomials. So take this as, um, as an ansatz for the lowest order um, approximation to this spectrum. And uh, by the way, um, when A equals 0, this works, because when A equals 0, this matrix is just 1, OK, independent of the matrix elements. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then this really is the solution. Um, we want small a because we want fine resolution of our object. Anyway, so take that as the zeroth approximation. And then the eigenvalues in this approximation are all zero except for one of them. OK. Now remember I showed you that the real, the actual eigenvalues don't quite do this. They, they, they get rapidly very small, but one of them is one, but the others are not zero. But this is in this, appro in this approximation. And uh, as I said, uh, these delta functions. It's, that's infinitely degenerate. That's the ultimate ill-conditioning uh, in this approximation. So you need to do better. You need to expand this, this uh, matrix for small a and do some intelligent perturbation theory. And for that, you need the matrix elements in the Legendre basis. Well, you can calculate the matrix elements exactly, uh, in the, the, these integrals of the Legendre and the Legendre and the matrix in between. And you can calculate them. and uh, as an infinite series with these coefficients, which are um, in terms of gamma functions. It's, it's exact. You can do that. OK. Now, for the eigenvalues, you know, in perturbation theory, you just need the diagonal elements to get the lowest order eigenvalues in perturbation theory. And, and here they are. And uh, I've written out the first few of them uh, of this matrix. And uh, the lowest order eigenvalues then are what I started with, this one, but now, now you've got these corrections. And here they are explicitly. And uh, that's the curve I showed you before. So it actually works rather well until you get down to the very, very small ones. But uh, it's, uh, it, it's pretty good. It means we're capturing something of the structure of this matrix, uh, exact and, and the continuum theory. OK. Now what about the eigenvectors? Well, you can correct them too. Uh, but they're these Legendre's first correction. And uh, now you see, actually, you're not bad. Until you get to these very low eigenvalues, you're reproducing somewhat the, uh, not badly at all, the structure of the eigenvectors, uh, the continuum theory and the exact. So we might see what happens to our scheme, our reconstruction scheme, in this limit. So oh, I've just shown you the improved approximation to the eigenvectors. Never mind, you can calculate that. So the reconstructed function now in the continuum approximation is a sum over these approximate eigenvectors times coefficients. And uh, the coefficients are integrals of the function you're trying to reproduce in this continuous set of coordinates um, times the uh, eigenvector. Uh, 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 and uh, now this sum converges for psi less than 1. That means it converges in the region where you want to reproduce the object. And uh, I've sh here's, a, here's an example. I take 5, I should be capital N. F I mean, the you, you can't cut this off anymore because in this approximation, there are infinitely many eigenvectors, so you have to choose. Once you get to 10, you've reproduced the function uh, rather well. 
again it's the same one with this quarter wavelength uh, uh, Gaussians separated by by uh, uh, something twentieth uh, of a wavelength separated by a quarter wavelength but outside the sampled range this does not converge this continuum approximation and as you increase the Q you see that you see that the, the range we're interested in is, is in here but the outside you get this log 10 Q equals 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 the continuum reconstructions and the discrete reconstructions you can check that it's right and uh, for this you need several hundred digit arithmetic so this is seriously unstable and the unstable sh instability of the continuum approximation shows itself when you go outside the super oscillatory uh, range um, so that's a bad thing um, no, 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 no. Uh, anyway uh, you see how unstable this is that I've shown you but it's unstable in a different way because I told you that uh, these waves reproduce exactly at multiples of this H well they do but the depth of focus that is the range of H within which this uh, reproduction uh, resurrection occurs is extraordinarily narrow that's the depth of focus and I'll show you finish by showing you that so here you have um, here you have uh, your uh, your state that's what I've shown you before with your coefficients and uh, I'm now looking I've shown you this uh, already this is uh, just a second no no I haven't sorry so this is your initial state or the state at uh, uh, age everything reproduces well, that's what we're trying to reproduce if you go to 10 to the minus 45 for that example it starts to go wrong and uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 45 well look it's 20,000 and uh, and if you go to just to, for interest to the middle of the range it's uh, 10 to the 49 so this function that you're wanting to reproduce so rapidly loses its super oscillations it grows to some vast value comes back again but again only over a range a tiny range of, uh, of uh, uh, 10 to the minus uh, 50 or so in the extreme case I've shown of course which isn't what a microscopist would try to do but you know we're theorists you want to find you know what are the limitations um, now you can look at the modulus uh, along the symmetry line so psi equals zero is where you get these fast os oscillations and let's go along z and see what happens and that's quite a simple function if you put psi equals zero so it's just a simple Fourier series and, and here it is again I've chosen doesn't matter a equals a q equals 10 um, so I'm going from zero to two pi from super oscillation to super oscillation and up it comes to 10 to the 30 so again tiny depth of focus um, and you can calculate, I can estimate how big that is and it's gigantic um, and again basically it's h to the h h over lambda to the h over lambda so it's a, a bad thing okay and the depth of focus is um, is the size of the thing you decide to look at the fine detail again to the over the wavelength which you want to be small but it's raised to this enormous power so once again it's uh, it's bad um, so let me summarize this what I've told you in principle you can propagate subwave information exactly now it exactly means reproducing the object sampled a number of points equal to the repetition distance measured as a function of wavelengths with no evanescent waves and not paraxially okay the dream of microscopists but in principle means that propagation carries a very heavy price there's a pathological sensitivity to noise and there's a tiny depth of focus and I think that um, the examples which people have published microscopists where they've used schemes like this to get a modest degree of, uh, of uh, super resolution they really gonna they run into very serious trouble when uh, when uh, if they wanted to do better they don't say this in the paper well I've talked to them they realize that there is this there are these exponential barriers they don't realize how bad the barriers are and that's what this analysis uh, has shown now there's a lot more mathematics in what I've shown you than I've been able to do 
I mean, that matrix, that integral equation, or the discrete matrix, has an interesting structure. So I'm sure there's a great deal more that uh, if mathematicians would get hold of it and look into it, uh, they could find. But I think I'll capture the essence of, uh, of, of what happens. You can reproduce this structure, but there are these prices that you have to pay. Uh, and, and these are the, the loose ends, I was saying. <coughs> this very large Q, small a, asymptotics of that matrix equation needs to be understood better, and also the connection with schemes that other people have, uh, have proposed. So, that's um, what I wanted to tell you today. Now, everything I've told you in these uh, lectures is published, much of it by other people, but among my own papers, there's this list here of papers on super oscillations and related matters, and this is a file that, um, that Jeff has, which anybody can get from him if they want it. So thank you, and thank you very much for the, all your, for your company and lovely conversations I've had with you, and uh, the very, very nice visit, which I'll remember. Thank you very much. Good. Well, we have some time for questions. I shall turn into a pumpkin and disappear in a little while, but... A uh, quick question I have, which is really not a question, just a comment. Yes. By looking, I mean, listening to all of your talks, uh, my impression is, and probably everybody else shares, <coughs> it's a remarkable field. Mm -hmm. Is that the illusion, or it's really so? I mean, the wealth of information and, and behavior of these functions that you showed, either through your work or somebody else's, is mm. just overwhelming and very surprising. Should I attribute this to just my non-knowledge of this stuff, or this is really remarkable even for specialists? Well, the it's hard to say. I mean, you know, when you've been working with this stuff for a long time, it begins to seem natural, of course. So uh, this is, I mean, you're asking a question which is halfway between psychological and sociological, and, uh, and I don't quite know how to answer it. I mean, you've almost answered it yourself. Um, yes, it's a field. Not many people work with it, but there are a few people. I mean, we're not the only people. They're, there's, um, uh, oh, what's, the, the, what's the name of the guy in, next to Perimeter? Oh, uh, in, in the Waterloo. Anyway, there are a few people who, uh, who, who have proved things about uh, classes of super oscillatory function. Oh, you, you know the guy, name, German guy. Kempf, yeah, Achim Kempf, um, who, you know, published some very good analyses of uh, some of these functions, but there aren't many of us, you know. And of course, you have Keir, who seems to understand anything without... I mean, as, as, as Sandu said at uh, yeah, Keir's, uh, the meeting in Jerusalem celebrating AB effect, yeah, yeah, Keir has spent his life avoiding mathematics. But he's actually a deeply mathematical thinking, thinking person. But, uh, so he understands a lot, but not everything. You know, not all of this, but a lot of it. But, yes, so on. You know, and then there are the experimentalists. I quite deliberately described several experiments, though it's not my field at all, and if you would ask me too many details, like you would re I would reveal my ignorance, but still, these are experiments where um, these ideas are either implicit or explicit, and something is good to know. It's good when a subject combines, is relevant to both experiment and theory, and, you know, not just physics, also mathematics. So, and then there's this lovely work I mentioned with Mark, by Mark Dennis, where you have this uh, understand all these shifts, beam shifts, different kinds of beam shifts as examples of weak values. So uh, it's a field that's acquiring coherence, you know. Not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but anyway, it is. It's, it's, it's usually, a, for me, it's usually a sign to go and do something else. But <laughs> yes? Well, on, in uh, lecture two, but, uh, you, you, Yes. Lecture two, you had an example of um, uh, vortices yes. that were singular. Vortices? And yes. What was the question? Uh, so, yes. There was an example, and my question is, to me, uh, from my superficial understanding of this whole area, um, it struck me as sort of um, an example of nonlinear, you know, singularities. And has anyone thought, or is 
is there is there any cross disciplinary thought no, on it, thank you for saying on, thank on, you for that uh, yeah. um, the answer is no it's very interesting because everything that I've talked about is linear these forces are linear phenomena now you do get forces in nonlinear equations of course you do but think of this that uh, like the Ginsburg Landau equation or the something something Pitaevsky equation but think of this near a vortex everything is very small so even nonlinear equations are locally linear near vortices now I had um, interesting discussion in the 1980s when people are going to begin to look at non-linear optics inside laser cavities and they showed these pictures of vortices lots of they said look these are non-linear phenomena I had to explain to them no you get almost exactly the same arrangements of vortices in superpositions of linear waves just that people hadn't thought of it before so and I mentioned the acoustic example as I'm speaking now this is purely linear so you do get vortices uh, in nonlinear, and, and one difference which is important is, is this that the vortices that um, that I talked about of course there are correlations between them but there's, there's not you can't think of them as dynamical objects you shouldn't think of people you can think of them as particles which in the plane at these points they annihilate they obey certain conservation laws but there's nothing analogous to a force between them but when you go to nonlinear uh, waves, then there is, you can begin to think of the vortices and the core surrounding them, where they're not small, as being objects that have forces and uh, move according to dynamical laws and so on. So there is a difference, but uh, you don't see that when you look at just the patterns that the vortices make. They're almost independent of the type of wave equation, linear or nonlinear. It's just a phenomenon of complex functions in the plane or in three dimensions. Not analytic functions, complex functions of position. And that's really almost independent of the universality. So, so yes and no is the answer. Good. Okay. Let, me, let me just say thank you, Michael, on behalf of the entire university and all of us here. This has been a fantastic week. You know, many of us, we understand some of the math behind super oscillation, and I stress the word some, yeah. and we obviously learned it mostly from Yakir and Jeff, mm -hmm. and so in connection with the weak values. So for me, and I know I speak for my friends as well, this has been a spectacular uh, panorama, uh, how should I say, landscape, in which you, you help us understand some of the other physics that's behind it. So thank you. I also want to thank you for a fantastic popular lecture you gave the other day. Oh, oh, okay. And for the one today on resurgent functions and and, uh, and divergent series. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Good.